So super happy to kick off this sustainable finance explain sessions. Um, and joining me today, I have Alicia, super proud to introduce uh, my colleague. She's a corporate finance director for the circularity and waste sector here at SCG. She has background in banking in the UK and since joining SCG two years ago, Alicia has been focusing her expertise in raising finance for circular companies and projects. And I think that the question that I've always uh, liked to, to ask you, Alicia, is how can sustainability be integrated into corporate financing? Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do here at Sustainable Capital Group. Um, and sustainability is really integrated into corporate finance when we use the financing to motivate and incentivize the achievement of sustainability goals. Now, there are many levels across which you can do this with varying degrees of influence from a soft declaration of compliance with mm -hmm. environmental permits and regulation, all the way up to something like a sustainability linked loan, where you can actually directly see the financial value of achieving a sustainability target. This happens when a loan has a margin ratchet, whereby the interest rate is adjusted based on the sustainability performance. Meaning if you meet your sustainability target, the interest rate decreases and you're financially rewarded. If you do not, the interest rate goes up and you are financially punished. And this is what we mean by using corporate finance to create incentives, tangible, sustainable incentives. Of course, this requires setting targets for your future sustainability performance. And in order to know your future, you need to know your history. You need to collect data. Um, you need to understand what are the sustainability topics that are most material to your company. You need to be able to measure the target and it needs to be a good combination between feasible yet ambitious. But that's yeah, a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it makes total sense. And I think that this is like the most sophisticated way we can integrate sustainability into financing, right? By creating this linked structure. But here, I think that we take the approach that um, we also consider um, including uh, accomplishments and targets, as you explained before, like a simple integrated solution. And I think that another important topic to say is that our mission in SCG is that we have sustainability obligations inside of the financial contracts, right? This is what we do. And we consider that we have accomplished our mission once. Our transaction does not only give back contractually financial returns, but also improvements in sustainability performance, right? Exactly. It's tangible. It's something specific. It's not just an empty promise. We really want to integrate it uh, and, and make it actually linked, which is what we would define as a sustainable finance transaction. Thinking specifically about examples here, um, have you recently worked in any circularity and risk projects where you've helped the client to set up sustainability linked transactions? Yes, actually, we are working on a project right now uh, for a company who is using recycled materials, uh, which is a really interesting sector in itself. Um, and we're actually looking at an equity fundraising and we want to make this equity linked to, to sustainability. But of course, there isn't an interest rate that we can just adjust. So mm -hmm. it's quite different to something like a sustainability linked loan. It's maybe a little bit more complex and requires a little bit more creativity and innovation on our side. So instead of just looking at an interest rate, we need to consider what other financial incentives are there. And something that comes to mind, which is already, you know, a structure very much used is uh, a management incentive plan. But mm -hmm. this time, the incentive is based on the achievement of the sustainability KPIs, which mm -hmm. the investor can then also commit to providing an incentive, either through a bonus scheme or an ESOP plan. Mm -hmm. um, this sustainability linked compensation for management also works very well as a direct and tangible financial incentive. 
Now, this company that we're looking at is already quite sustainability oriented. They already have some systems and procedures in place. They have been measuring some data already. And our team has actually conducted a sustainable finance assessment for them to support them with identifying the material topics and selecting which KPIs should be the focus, such as uh, recycled material content, for example, or mm -hmm. employee satisfaction. You've got to think of the E, the S and the G. Mm -hmm. And this not only helps the company with their own business planning and their sustainability strategy, but it has also significantly helped us with this transaction because it has opened the company up to a whole additional category of investors focused on impact. Mm -hmm. And the company was ready and prepared to lead those conversations. When investors have been asking, what are your sustainability goals? Being on the front foot has made the company that much more attractive to investors and has made this process that little bit smoother, which is always what we're looking for. <laughs> Oh, that's that's very interesting, and it's it's super interesting and to see how everything is moving into the same direction. We are seeing uh, like higher interest from investors on sustainability uh, data, but at the same time, we're seeing like this big big development when it comes to the regulations on sustainability reporting. And I think that it's a it's a nice bridge for us to start talking about the second topic, uh, which is. Uh, regulations regarding sustainability reporting. Right. I think that um, it, the, the investors are looking into sustainability further because they are suffering pressure from not only their stakeholders, but also the regulation. And I think that when it comes to regulation on sustainability reporting, we have three main regulations that are leading um, in the European Union. One is the EU taxonomy, which creates a classification for sustainable activities. The other one, the SFDR, which defines what are the sustainability disclosures for investors. And the CSRD, which determines what is the type of non-financial information companies need to gather in order to embed into their financial reporting. So in the end, we will have an integrated non-financial slash financial reporting. So um, thinking about this, and this is something that we apply into, into our, our analysis as well, because companies not only need to look into what investors are looking for, but now they have to also think about what regulations they are under, right? Exactly, yeah. And, and any company who is thinking about doing a fundraising or bringing a new investor on board needs to think of the investor perspective. What is the investor going to ask? What are they looking for? What do I need to prove to them? And of course, you need to show an attractive business model, a solid financial plan, a strong team and other important elements. But you also need to show that you have what they are looking for when it comes to sustainability objectives, particularly when it comes to these Article 9 funds, yeah. which are investing with a sustainability objective. Um, yeah. They need the data to make their disclosures, so you need to give them the data so that you comply and the investor complies. Yeah, exactly. And I think that thinking about that and the famous Article 8, 9 classification, the topics that everyone everyone is talking about, I think that one important point to say here is to create a differentiation between a fund level and a company level. Here we... At fund level and financial product, uh, we have the Article 6, 8, and 9 classification, right? Article 6, uh, financial products that do not consider uh, sustainability. Uh, Article 8 is a product that promotes environmental and social characteristics. And the Article 9 is a fund that has a sustainable investment objective. So this classification is under SFDR, which is applicable to funds. So funds have to define themselves their level uh, of, of uh, sustainability ambition and therefore disclose accordingly. But if you are a company, you have to imagine that you're going to fall under the portfolio of these funds. So your type of classification, your type of disclosure is a different type of disclosure. You have to make sure you have all the elements to fit inside of a portfolio fund. So if, if of, of a portfolio of a fund, Article 8 or Article 9, 
right? So people get very confused about this. And I think it's super nice to, to create a, a differentiation here. Mm. So thinking about the best type of uh, asset and investment, when it comes to sustainability, there is there, out there, it would be uh, an investment that would be eligible to fit under an Article 9 portfolio because it's the hardest, right? The most stringent uh, sustainability um, definition. And what is this? Like the regulation creates a definition of sustainable investment. And a sustainable investment, according to SFDR, is an investment that contributes to an envir either an environmental or social objective. It do no harm to any of the other objectives and follow good governance practices. So if you are a company and you want to fit inside of an Article 8 or 9 portfolio, you don't have to do the 8 or 9 classification yourself, but you have to make sure that you can be classified as a sustainable investment. Exactly. And I think businesses focusing on the circular economy, they typically emphasize waste reduction and maximizing resource efficiency and often have, uh, often have methods of uh, enhancing their contribution to or reducing their contribution to climate change. And through that, they already inherently align closely with the sustainable investment objectives as set out by the EU taxonomy and SFDR. So circular businesses are in a prime position to mold themselves into an attractive investment opportunity yes. for Article 8 and Article 9 funds. And they should be using this as part of their USP, as part yes. of their competitive advantage to come to these funds and say, look, I'm an amazing company, but I am also a sustainable company. And I want to become one of your portfolio companies. And that makes it that much easier for these funds to accept you in. Exactly. And a very good point there, because companies in the circularity sector, they are intrinsically impactful, right? Everything that they do. However, it is important to also take a look into the do no significant harm and the good governance practices. And I think that how can you make sure that you are doing no significant harm? And here, I think that we can talk about the, the other mostly talked about topic in the European Union when it comes to sustainability, which is the shift between financial materiality to double materiality, which is something that was adopted by the CSRD, which is a regulation that is applicable to uh, companies, um, usually big companies, let's put it like that, um, put it briefly. And the CSRD requests there for you to have to do a double materiality assessment in order for you to identify what are the, among all the topics in the world that you can report, what are the most relevant for you and applicable to your company when it comes to the impact that the company has from in, out, inside, out, and what is the, the impact that the environment would have in the activities of the company. So exactly. based on this, yeah, it's a holistic yeah. perspective. So uh, you can't just think about how climate change might affect your own assets. You have to think about how your assets and business activities might affect climate change or biodiversity or water management or so many of these other aspects. You can't just think, oh, I'm reducing waste, therefore I'm a sustainable company. You also need to think, am I uh, causing any pollutive activities? Am I uh, releasing any hazardous waste or hazardous chemicals. So it's really this holistic perspective of not just your direct impact, but your broader externalities, really. Yeah. And, and thinking about that, I, it, it might sound daunting for some companies when they think about all these things that they suddenly have to do. But I think that it's perfectly possible for you to create and embed this into a roadmap. So just thinking about a, a recent project that we did for, for the, the, this company, right, Alicia, we worked together on this uh, company on the circularity sector, and it is a company uh, scaling up. So there was, there is not, all the processes are not yet in place, but there is a lot of things that they have already done. So what we did was a quick scan 
on the basis of regulatory standards. We know that CSRD is going to hit these companies at some point, right? So we include CSRD in the future roadmap of the company according to the financial information uh, when this company becomes CSRD uh, eligible. But before that, we kind of prep them towards CSRD. And how we do that is that we do like a stakeholder mapping to understand what are the most important stakeholders for this company at the moment. And of course, if the company is looking for financing, investors are one of the main stakeholders they should pay attention to, therefore SFDR. So it's super nice that we use SFDR indirectly for the companies. And we also focus on how can the companies, especially the ones that have a sustainable business model, confidently prove their sustainability claims, right? I think that this is a point that we pay very close attention, especially for, especially for the, the financial side of things as well, right, Alicia, when you have a sustainable business model. Exactly. You need to, you can't just say, oh, I'm doing all of these sustainable things. It's amazing. You have to prove it. You have to provide evidence, verification, um, and really make sure you're considering what you're doing now, but also making you future-proof. As you say, yeah. considering CSRD before it's even applicable to you. Um, and that's something really important. And that's something that sustainable finance allows you to consider. And just jumping now into my favorite part, which is talking about the future. <laughs> So just quickly picking your brain, Alicia, I know you've been doing like extensive research in the sector, talking to a lot of parties, being part of like conferences, working groups. So you're pretty, pretty active in that. So I would love to hear from you if you have spotted in uh, any type of trends in sustainable finance within the circularity and waste projects over the, the past year, or do you think, how do you think they will develop? Yeah, I think the undeniable trend that everyone can observe is the continued growth in investment in the circularity sector. More and more investors are considering this as a subsector that they want to be part of. Uh, some investors are setting up funds dedicated to circularity. Some are purely focusing on circular investments and set their own internal KPIs uh, according to that. And we are seeing more types of investors coming into the space. Mm -hmm. I would say it's still led by venture capital due to the innovative and new nature of the sector and the technological development still happening, but also corporates and strategic investors. More and more corporates want to invest in the latest technologies, not only so they can stay ahead of the competition curve, but also as they set increasingly ambitious targets for themselves, they need to find innovative ways to meet these targets. Increasingly, governments are considering the circular economy as a key focus alongside the typical themes we think about, such as climate change and energy transition. Mm -hmm. And all of this investment is driven by the possibility to develop impactful and industry shaping technologies that mm -hmm. could not only reduce costs through efficiency and resource optimization, but also create a competitive advantage and improve your impact. Uh, on the environment and social and governance. And that could be through the form of investing into recycling technologies, particularly a, a subsector that's growing there is different methods of chemical recycling. This is really seeing a surge of interest. Yeah. This could be a sorting technology, which is really advancing, particularly with developments in AI and machine learning. This could be the sharing economy where the focus is on reuse um, and and apps and software, mm -hmm. there are really many areas and touch points that circular economy could fit into, and therefore many investment poss possibilities that could fit with funds as well. Very interesting. Well, I think we are done here. It was just great talking to you as always and exchanging ideas on the topic. Thank you. It was great fun as well.